Welcome, everybody, to Sunday morning at the Marxist Library. But of course, we're not meeting physically at the Neville Proctor Library, Marxist Library in Oakland anymore. Since the pandemic, we've been on Zoom. And you can reach us on icssmarks.org. That's our website. And the uh, video we're recording right now and the video of this program will be available at ICSS, the initials, marks.org um, in a day or two from now. Um, and we, since we now are a virtual presentation rather than an in-person pr um, presentation, I can say Good afternoon to our speaker, who's um, in the East Coast, and, and all over the, the world we can reach people and have reached people. So it's good, af good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Let me just digress a moment from our script and just comment that it's not a good morning in Gaza. And I, I'm sorry to add that, but it's kind of, I think, on all of our minds. So I say good morning to Gaza, but I say the word in Hebrew, shalom. Shalom means good morning, but it also means peace. And we desperately need a ceasefire and a just peace in Gaza. So I'll get back to the, to the usual script. Um, but one, one other interjection. Right now, as we speak, a very important election is being taking place in Argentina. Argentina is the second largest economy in, in Latin America, the sec, um, in, excuse me, in South America, the, the third largest economy in Latin America. And the left centrist finance minister from the incumbent Peronist uh, party. Uh, Sergio Massa is pitted against, at this very moment, um, an extreme right libertarian, Javier Millet. And so um, by the end of this um, program, we may know whether um, Argentina is heading for a train wreck or not. But back, back to the program. For over a decade and a half, Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library has been a platform for diverse presentations on a variety of topics, political economy, the struggles of the working class, the fight against imperialism and militarism, resisting racial and gender injustice. You definitely do not have to be a Marxist to present at the library or to participate, but we, the Institute for the Critical Study of Society, we go by the acronym ICSS, are united in our respect for the work of Karl Marx and we believe that his work remains relevant today. Our motto is taken from Karl Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach. Philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. You can sign up for email notifications for future programs, past, view past programs, and contact us through our website, icssmarks.org. And we always welcome input, feedback, suggestions for topics and speakers. My name is Roger Harris. I'm on the program committee that organizes the Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. And I um, we're very happy to have our pre uh, um, today's program, which is on the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine will be 200 years old on December 2nd of this year, just a, just a few um, days from now. And it's um, of considerable importance. So we have brought uh, one of our favorite speakers back to the library. That's Mark Albertson. He's a frequent presenter at the library. And um, he is a military historian and he has a commanding knowledge as those of you who know him a commanding knowledge of geopolitics. He is the historical research editor at the Army Aviation Magazine and is the historian for the Army Aviation Association of America. He has authored several books, including the USS Connecticut, subtitled Constitution State Battleship. Another book is They'll Have to Follow You, The Triumph of the Great White Fleet, on History, a treatise. And he is currently working on a two-volume history on the saga of Army aviation. Mark's, Mark teaches at Norfolk K-12 
Community College in Norfolk, Connecticut. So Mark, if you could tell us about the Monroe Doctrine, and, and particularly, I think we'll, we'll be interested in um, its most current um, iterations and the connections between the U.S. Imperialist Project and the Zionist Project in the area of the Monroe Doctrine. Thank you, Mark. It's all yours. Thank you, Roger, and good afternoon, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, to start with, what I did was, if you have any questions or comments or observations after the fact, I put my two email addresses in the chat. So if you if an idea comes up later on, I mean, feel free to feel free to drop me a line. I'll I'll answer it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dodge you. Anyway, this is um yes, it's 200 years ago as of Dece uh, as of upcoming December second, uh, the Monroe Doctrine. Well, what is with the Monroe Doctrine? Uh, it's a quest for it's a quest. For for land, I mean, land. Land is one of the biggest reasons man goes to war. It always, it was, is, and probably always will be. And it's not just the land itself. It's what's on the land, what's in the land, or how, how, what land is it that 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 you're dicing for control for? Uh, where is it strategically placed? And I bring that, and I bring up Korea here because when you when you go back and take a look at Korean history, uh, the, the 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 it points like a knife blade at Japan. And so, and so in the 1945 Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese kicked the Russians out and took control of Korea. Now they've eliminated that threat of being invaded by Tsarist Russia. However, at the same time, Korea can be used as a launching platform onto the, onto the Asian continent. And what did they do in 1931? They invaded Manchuria. So that's just an example here. But for our purposes today, the place to start is with Sam Adams. Sam Adams was considered one of those more liberal founders of the country. And this is what he had to say in 1878. He says here, we shall never be upon a solid footing till Britain cedes to us what nature designs we should have or till we wrest it from her. What does that sound like? Uh, interesting. In other words, he's one of those that already knows that once they toss the British out of here, guess where we're going? West. And we're going south. And if we can, we're going north. Of course, we tried to grab Canada and it didn't quite work out too well. But that's 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 really what you're seeing here. However, at the same time, you know, once the British are, are tossed out of here and the country forms the 13, the 13 original states. Now, I find it interesting that that during the Constitutional Convention, May, May to September 17, uh, 1787, in July 1787, the Northwest Ordinance comes out. Now, what is that? That Ohio River Valley Territory. Uh, in July. We're going for this. We're not even a. We're not even officially a country yet, and we've already put out really our first piece of legislation prior to us being a country. Now it says in the Constitution that every new every new territory that becomes a state, uh, you know, if if a petitions to become a state and it becomes a state, is guaranteed a Republican form of contra or constitution. Note the word Republican. Not a democracy. America was not founded as a democracy. Yet, what do your, a lot of your politicians say today? They ha they ha they have they haven't read the Constitution. Apparently not. But having said that, by you know, once the country's formed, then and we begin to and we begin to spread. In fact, uh, the first state to come out of that Northwest Ordinance will be Ohio, March one, two thousand three. Now, interesting. It's said in that Northwest Ordinance that every new territory, once it reaches 60,000 settlers, it can, it can petition to become a state. And many of your founders thought, well, this whole territory can be up to maybe three to five states, winds up being about five, winds up being five. But this is what they were, this is what they were uh, prognosticating here. But having said that, uh, when, 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 once you get into the 18th century, the race is on here, a 19th century, the race is really on here. And I'm, and I'm not talking about the threat to, by outsiders. I'm talking about the, the fact that slavery, you know, not slavery really causes the war. It's the difference of opinion between the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians. Jefferson made the comment, and he's the leader of this group, 
that those people who dig in the dirt on talking farmers are the best protector of Republican limited elective government, not people who want to go with industrialization. Alexander Hamilton is a bit different. Yes, we need farmers, but industrialization and finance is the wave of the, is the wave of the future. He will be right. This is what's going to cause what we call the Civil War. I call it the revolt of the planters. But that's what's going to cause this war. And it's that race between which territories are going to come in as free, which territories are going to come in as slave. And that matters because if there's more free states, they can control Congress. They've got, they've got control of the legislative branch. Keep in mind, presidents were weak here. If the slave states can control it, they've got the whip hand here. That really causes the war because by, by the late 1850s, many of these Southerners know they're losing the race. So let's bolt. But there are threats from the outside. Keep in mind, we bought the Louisiana Territory for, for, for $15 million from Napoleon. But as the British, as the British said in the, after, the, after we declared war on them in 1812, it's a tragedy that we went to war with our English speaking cousins because what the, our English speaking cousins don't realize is that the Royal Navy is the Alps for the United States. Because if we don't defeat Napoleon, they're going back. And there's probably truth to this. There's probably truth to this. But by 1815, the war comes to a the war comes to an end. Now, keep in mind the Treaty of Ghent, to which John Quincy Adams was the lead negotiator. Uh, the British in 1814 wanted to drop the Canadian border deep into New York State and kick us out of the Ohio River Valley and give it back to the Indians. Now, John Adams, his son is his son is the lead negotiator at Ghent. To, sent his son a note. Don't you dare give the British an acre. I would rather fight this war forever than give them an acre. You know, uh, and that's exactly what his son is going to do. However, the British offensive coming out of the Great Lakes down Lake Champlain proved a bust. And Lord Wellington is telling London and also the negotiators at Ghent, make a deal with the Americans because we cannot take control of the Great Lakes. So they're going to make a deal. And that deal will be signed on by December 26, 1814. And so interesting here, neither side lost any territory. Now, this is significant because John Quincy Adams is going to say, I hope this is the last peace treaty we ever have to sign with the British. Since neither side lost territory, it will be the last peace treaty we have to sign with the British. We haven't signed a peace treaty with the British since 1814. Now, that should be construed as significant. You don't think there aren't some Germans that don't want East Prussia back? You don't think there aren't some Ukrainians that want part of Poland back? You don't think there aren't some Poles who want piece of Ukraine back? You don't think there aren't some Mexicans who would want who not want Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Utah back? I mentioned that at a talk on this two weeks ago, and some lady in the back of the room said, well, they can have Texas. So, you know. But this idea of land does not die. However, here, no land was lost. Now, you can see where this is going. History tells us where this is going at this point. In 1815, the United States and Britain will sit down and peacefully discuss fishing rights, fishing rights for American fishermen off the Grand Banks. They sat around and they discussed this. Another, another aspect comes out of this, 1817 the rush Bago Treaty. The British announced they were going to put 100-ton warships on the Great Lakes. The United States negotiators sat down with British negotiators and peacefully reached an agreement here. Each Navy, Royal Navy and the United States Navy, will have one 100-ton war, a gunboat with one 18-pounder gun on Lake Champlain, one on Lake Ontario, and two such craft on the other Great Lakes. In 1818, an agreement, they sit down again, an agreement is made between Britain and the United States. 
stip stipulating the border between the United States and Canada, most of which still exists today. They also agreed to a joint occupation of the Oregon Territory. Now, the British had, uh, will, will agree to, to a joint occupation because they're not stupid. This is what made them the consummate imperialist power. You know, they know how to read a map. You know that thing Americans don't seem to do too well with today? Geography? And so they will use us for the next 10 years, I'm talking 1818, 1828, jointly occupy Oregon. Now, again, the British know their history. Remember, at one point, part of the Pacific Northwest was ruled by Tsarist Russia. In 1821, the Tsar said they were going to try to get some of this territory back. The British told them no. The United States told them no. They're working together here to keep Russia out of, out of, the, out of the New World. On top of that, again, the British know how to do configure arrangements like this. Uh, they're going to jointly occupy Oregon because they know the United States is moving west, and they don't want the United States moving into Canada from the west. They're not stupid. However, 1815, interesting, interesting what, what you're seeing here in 1815, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Congress at Vienna. Now, keep in mind, this is, this is after the fall of Napoleon. And so Britain, uh, France will be admitted into this when the Bourbons are put back on the throne. Uh, so uh, the Napoleon's failure uh, brought the Bourbons back. And then you're also going to have Prussia. Austria, Tsarist Russia, creating a new balance of power. Now, the country in question here is Spain. Remember in 188, Napoleon took control of Spain until 1813. And all of those, colon all those colonies in Central and South America, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to bolt. The idea is to help bring Spain back into the fold as one of the overseers of Europe. Tsarist Russia, the Romanovs, the Hohenzollerns in Prussia, the Habsburgs in Austria will oversee Eastern and Central Europe, and they're going to form something known as the Holy Alliance. Uh, there's nothing holy about this. This is just what they're going to call it. Keep in mind, you're seeing Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and, and, and maybe Lutherans, Protestants here. That's a mix for you. On the other side, it's going to be the, the British, the French, and they're trying to admit Spain back in. Now, to do this, to make Spain a bona fide power, keep in mind with Napo when Napoleon got kicked out, Spain became a basket case. There's upheavals going on in Spain. And interesting what they're going to try to do here, the, the, the French are for this, the Spanish obviously are, uh, the Prussians were for this, the Austrians were for this, to resurrect Spain by getting their colonies back in Central and South America. That's why if you read the Monroe Doctrine, Monroe made mention of Portugal and Spain. And this comes out of what's known as the Congress of Verona, 1822 going into 1823. And the French were willing to put together a French and Spanish army to come back to Central and South America to get those colonies back. Now, keep in mind, the French sent an army into Spain in 1822 to put down the revolutionaries and bring order to Spain. That's That all comes out of this. Monroe is, you know, Monroe find, obviously finds out about this, and he comes out with this Monroe Doctrine. The Europeans are no longer allowed to set up new colonies in the New World. The colonies that are here, they can't do much about. Keep in mind, this is 22 years before a terminology comes out that even today is fairly popular. It's called Manifest Destiny. That was the product of a journalist in 1845. But we're, that's so the document is 22 years ahead of that ahead of that pronouncement, Manifest Destiny, that this land is ordained for us and us alone. We don't want the Europeans coming back here. Now, guess who backs, of all the countries in Europe, guess who backs the Monroe Doctrine? The British. Keep in mind, the British 
are moving into the Middle East. They are moving their Indian empire west. Now, why are they doing this? Because they notice the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. They empty into the Persian Gulf. That empties through the Strait of Hormuz into the Arabian Sea. All Tsarist Russia has to do with, 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 a weakening, with a weakening Ottoman Empire is to go down those two rivers through the, through the Persian Gulf, through the Strait of Hormuz, and they can get to colonial India. And the British are going to plug this gap. You know, they're, they're a superpower. They're the, they're the world's superpower at this point. But even they're stretched because of, because of their, their, their movement in the Atlantic and into the Pacific as well. And keep in mind, it's not going to be long before all of Europe is going to be going into Africa. This is the this is the highlight of European imperialism, is what you're saying. And we are trying to keep them out. We are going to keep them out because the British support us. This is another aspect coming out of the Treaty of Ghent. So you're seeing over the lo a long period of time here, America and Britain coming closer and closer and closer together. And with no European impediments, who is the only opposition to the American advancement on this continent? The Indian. Does the Indian have artillery? Does the Indian have, have, uh, have, have, a, have navies? No, he doesn't. And, he's, and, his, and these tribes are split. And the Anglo-Saxon is going to keep marching across this continent and you get to the same thing with the Mexican-American War, 1846-1848. And, and so America is advancing. However, there is discussions in the United States to advance, to advance the speed of our or to advance the speed here across this across this great continent. How about building a canal in Central America? We don't have to sail around South America anymore. Enter the British. The British will not allow us to build a canal in Central America. They hold the whip hand here. People say, there are members of Congress who say, who, who say that, well, this is a violation of the Monroe Doctrine. There is such a thing, there is such a thing uh, as, as understanding the reality of the situation here. We don't want the British building a canal here either. So the two are going to consummate a deal. They're going to consummate the deal. And they make they draw up an agreement. And in 1850, both the United States and Britain will not build a canal in Central and Central America without the support, acquiescence, or, or coordination with the other power. Neither will build a canal here. And this and this and this agreement will last for the next 51 years, when it's replaced by the hay pants fought Treaty of 1901, giving the United British give up their rights. And what do you think Teddy Roosevelt's gonna do with this? And what do you think America's gonna have by, two, by 1913? The Panama Canal. But up to this point, the British know we are growing. And as we're, and they don't mind us growing because there's not much they can do about it, but they don't want us growing too fast. In 1860, 61, Southern states begin to leave the country and we call it the Civil War. Again, I call it the revolt of the planters. That disagreement of opinion between those who profess the Jeffersonian notion, those who profess the Hamiltonian notion, uh, go to war. Slavery is the engine of agrarian capitalism. They are going to lose the war because they're going to be fighting an industrialized conflict. Keep in mind, the Southerners, believe it or not, the Southerners had 20,681 factories. They had over 110,000 people working in them. The North had over, has over uh, 111,000 factories, and they've got over 1,100,000 people working in them. The North controls the resources. The North controls the banking system. The North has most of the population. Who is going to win an industrialized war here? The United States. And it does in 1865. However, having said that, this is the notion since it won the war, the, uh, the Hamiltonian notion won the war, the, American, the United States is now going to industrialize. 
It's going to financialize. In fact, between 1860 and 1900, the country will go from producing $2 billion in manufactured goods to $11.5 billion by 1900, over a, over a five-fold increase in four decades. The amount of factories went from about 131,000 up to almost 300,000 in that period. America knocked off the British in 18 in, in the middle in the middle of the 1890s to become the number one industrial power. But that leads to another issue. By this time, Chesapeake Bay is linked with the Golden Gate. Man, you know, this manifest destiny has worked. And the Monroe Doctrine, we have not been threatened only once. We were really threatened here only once. And that is during the Civil War. If you remember the if you remember Maximilian, the emperor in Mexico, was French installed. He's from the Habsburg family. The French put troops, this is Napoleon III, into Mexico. They want to resume that empire that they had here once before. Interesting, Lincoln was urged by Congress to throw the French out. Number one, he doesn't have the army for it yet. And number two, he has to fight the Confederates. How's he going to do both? But in 1865, when the Confederates are crushed and Lincoln is dead at this point, President John Andrew Johnson sends 50,000 Union troops, a well-blooded army, down to the Texas border. There was a very real possibility that we were going to go to war with the French. We were going to help Benito Juarez. That will not happen because in 1866, Otto von Bismarck is able to unite the German states under the banner of Prussia, not Vienna. That means one thing for Napoleon III. He's got to bring all those French troops home because now he's got a united Germany on his eastern frontier. So by 1866, that army on the front on the New Mexican border will go home. The French will leave. And Maximilian Robespierre, well, he's going to be hung like a Thanksgiving Day decoration off a tree. But by 1900, by 19, by almost 1900, America now is on its route to becoming, is on the route to becoming not only a continental power, but a, but a global power. Keep in mind, there are concerns here. We have 76 million people in the United States by 1895. Are they going to be able to digest all the goods we are producing? No. A book comes out here in 1890. It's called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, written by Alfred Thayer Mann. It takes the world by storm. This does for navies or naval power what what um, what uh, uh, Carl von Clausewitz's book on war did in 1835 for land power. Interesting, th Mayor, Alfred Thayer Mann says that a large navy will keep opposing fleets from your shores. He also said a navy guarantees overseas markets. What do you think we're going to do in 1898? We are going to go to war with Spain and we are going to grab the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico, and Cuba becomes a free nation if you want to believe that one. I suggest you read the, the, the Platt Amendment of 1901. And I like telling my elected officials back in Connecticut about the Platt Amendment and about Cuba from the perspective that Oliver Platt, the senator that put it through Congress, came from my state, Connecticut. So that's fun to do when you, when you tell this to Murphy or Blumenthal, or I tell it to Jim Himes, uh, talking about Cuba today. But what does this mean? This means America is now taking its place on the world stage. We are now going to use not just troops, though. We are going to we are going to change how imperialism is, is done here. The dollar. Why why shed blood over, over over land? Dollars you can print. We're going to do this in places like Haiti, Nicaragua, and other places in Central and South America. Central America, South America. That is the laboratory for future American imperialism. 
And you are seeing here by 1918, and the British and the French are beginning to fall, or are beginning their downward leg, and the United States is beginning that upward leg. And you can see where this is going by 1940. When in a press conference in January, Franklin D. Roosevelt will say, isn't it interesting, to journalists, this is a press conference. He says to journalists, Britain is in another war. And just as in the last war, they're going to have to liquidate many of their assets and investments overseas to pay for same. Wouldn't it be nice if we can ingest some of those investments and assets? What is he professing in 1940? Tax Americana. And in 1945, you are going to see, and that, 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 that's another thing about this. You know, there is no World War I and World War II. I gave a talk on this. There's only one war here that started in 19, America's, man's greatest industrialized conflict. You know, the world is going in this direction. Industrial revolution, land. You are now in the technology revolution. It's still land. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. But by 1945, America now is the world's ranking power. Your currency, the dollar is now the world's reserve currency, just at one point, the, but the pound was. But having said that, having said that, we in on Valentine's Day 1945, with the collapse of the British Empire, we now make a deal with Abdulaziz Ibn Saud. U.S. military protection for the kingdom versus preferential access to Saudi crude, and every president, be he Democrat or Republican, has catered to this agenda ever since. It's oil. That's what matters here. And so interesting here, what you see transpiring here. And I purposely dug this out of my files to let, to let you know where America's going here. And this is going to get us to Israel. This is from George Kennan. 1948. And let's understand something about Kennan. You know, you can really get a pretty good handle on modern history with regards to empire if you read people like Alfred Mackinder, Nicholas Spickman, George Kennan, and Zbigniew Brzezinski. Brzezinski we lost just not that long ago. But here, Kennan is a co-author of the Marshall Plan. Now, what is the Marshall Plan? The Marshall Plan, I got this as a, you probably got this as a kid too. We help save the world. Yeah, but for what? You know, Kennan understood you got 16,199,566 Americans in a uniform and 15 million of them are coming out. You better have a job for them after 45 because you trained them to kill. This is what the, this is what the Marshall Plan is about. You are going to resurrect Western Europe and Japan as dumping grounds for American goods. We are expanding our influence economically. We are going beyond the confines of the Monroe Doctrine. What I find interesting about this whole process here, we're telling in 1823 Europeans to stay the hell out of here. Yet, interestingly enough, and you can and you can see this for yourself, April 6, 1917 is one of the biggest days in American history because why? Congress got us involved in a European conflict. And have we? Been, and we're telling the we're telling the Europeans in 1823 to stay out of here. Have we gotten out of European affairs since April 6, 1917? Is Ukraine part of Europe? Yes. We are still involved. We never got out. That's the point. That's the point. And what you're seeing here is, according to George Kennan, we are going to resurrect Western Europe and Japan to be dumping grounds for American goods. We are taking the Monroe Doctrine and extending power industrially, financially. That's what we're doing here. This is where this has gone since 1823. Or if you wanna make, or if you wanna go back to what Sam Adams said in 1778, maybe this is where we've gone since 1878. We are finding our place under the sun. That's what 1945 means. And yet at the same time, you can see where the country is going. This is George Kennan in 1948. The U.S. has about 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6.3% of its population. 
In this situation, we cannot fail to be the object of envy and resentment. Our real task in the coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships which will permit us to maintain this position of disparity without positive detriment to our national security. To do so, we will have to dispense with all sentimentality and daydreaming, and our attention will have to be concentrated everywhere on our immediate national objectives. We need not deceive ourselves that we can afford the luxury of altruism and world benefaction. We should cease to talk about such vague and unreal objectives as human rights, the raising of, uh, raising of living standards and democratization, the day is not far off when we are gonna to have to deal in straight power concepts. The less we are then hampered by idealistic slogans, the better. And there's one more here. In 1954, President, President Dwight Eisenhower ordered, you remember Jimmy Doolittle? The Tokyo raid on April, April 18, 1942. Remember that 20, 20, 16 B-25s off the flight deck of the US Air, US Air, USS Hornet. First time that was ever done. Land-based bombers, really, off a carrier deck. Interesting, interesting, uh, interesting how that worked. But he's a lieutenant general now. He's not just a colonel anymore. And he's asked to do a report. And this is this was a top secret report at one point. The report on covert activities of the Central Intelligence Agency. Interesting what it says here. Recall, remember, remember what I just said, what, what, what uh, Kennan said. But here you see, it is clear now that we, this is in the introduction of this study. I have the study. It's an interesting read. It is now clear that we are facing an implacable enemy whose avowed objective, that's the Soviet Union that is, is world domination by whatever means and at whatever cost. There are no rules in such a game. What happened to rule of law? What happened to that? Hitherto acceptable norms of human conduct do not apply. If the United States is to survive longstanding, get this, longstanding American concepts of fair play must be reconsidered. We must develop effective espionage and counterespionage services and must learn to subvert, sabotage, and destroy our enemies by more clever, more sophisticated and more effective methods than those used against us. It may become necessary that the American people be made acquainted with, understand and support this fundamentally repugnant philosophy. Now, what have we done since 45? How many here remember Mosaddegh? How many here how many here remember what happened to Guatemala in in, in 1954? How many here remember what happened to uh uh, go, uh, go Din DM. How many here? How many here remember all of these? All of these. This is what America is doing to spread its power. This is no longer the republic anymore. That's gone out of all out the window. Yet to end this, we supported a country that was that won its so-called uh, sovereignty through a war against Arabs. It's called Israel. Now, if you recall. If you recall, the Balfour Declaration here is almost like, in a way, the Monroe Doctrine here is for the Zionists. Uh, they were supposed to have, to, of course, the, what are the British doing here? The British are also taking Jewish people out of Europe and putting them in the Middle East. Of course, it beats them going to Madagascar like the Nazis wanted to do. But the fact of the matter is that's what they're doing. It, Israel, what you're seeing here with Israel, it's being built as a colonial sat trap for the West because the British are pumping the oil out of Persia. With the Sykes-Picot Agreement, they are going to they're going to fashion a nation called Iraq so they can pump the oil out of this. And so they need that jump off point here called Palestine, and they're going to get the mandate for this because what's not far from Palestine, the Suez Canal. And the British don't share that with anyone. Yet after 1945, in 1945, and we make the deal with Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud, guess what the Amer guess what America's job is from since 1945? Number one, the dollar. It's the world's reserve currency. Our system, our society. 
society, our, our, our economy is built on the dollar as the world's reserve currency and also control of resources. That has been America's agenda since 1945. That's Pax Americana. That's the American empire. We, we are, we've painted ourselves in a corner because this thing built by the British known as Israel has developed a life of its own. It got to be a Frankenstein monster. It now is a country now that after the 60, 56, 67, 73 wars is now usurping the Balfour Declaration. Let's be honest here. They're usurping the Balfour Declaration here because what does it say in the Balfour Declaration? That these new that these new that these new people coming into the uh, coming into Palestine will not infringe upon the people who have been living here for centuries, their political autonomy, their society. What has happened to that since? That's their manifest destiny, and they are taking advantage of it. And so here you see with what's going on today, the, the United States, manifest destiny was that march to the to the to the to the to the golden gate manifest destiny we have taken that and gone overseas with it that's what we've done with this because now we're a global slash superpower israel is looking to build a greater israel here in the middle east and they have indians in the way too they're called palestinians that's what you're seeing develop here we have already said, according to the president, that we have Israel's back. We have no choice but to have Israel's back because America is a declining power. It needs that jump off point to stay in the Middle East. And I'm going to conclude with because there's another kibitzer coming into the game here. And that kibitzer is called China. If you recall some months back, what did China do here? They made a deal with, with the Saudi Arabia and Iran to, so the two countries can reach a rapprochement here. This is something the United States, this is something the United States could never do. Let's understand something. China is Iran's biggest oil customer. They're getting up to 26% of their oil from Saudi Arabia. They were able to accomplish something or try to accomplish something that we could never do, never, ever do. Because they don't, Peking does not have that baggage that the United States has. The United States has baggage. That baggage is not a suitcase, it's a steamer trunk. It's called Israel. The Chinese are not afflicted with this. So at this stage, of the and Ukraine, let's not forget Ukraine. To defend the dollar and to control resources, we are supporting the Ukrainians. Keep in mind, we are no longer using American troops here. We are using the dollar, and we're using the dollar to build the Ukrainian army. That, folks, is your army. Why do you think they're getting tanks? Remember when they weren't supposed to have tanks? Why do you think they're getting all this artillery? Remember, we weren't going to give them a lot of artillery. What's next? The aircraft? Drones? Missiles? This is a conventional war. Is this war going well? Not really, but now you've got a situation here in the Middle East and China is not fighting it. And let's understand something else here about the Israelis. They are being used as pawns too. They were used by the British and they're being used by us. And let's get down to it here. It's the Israelis that fight Hezbollah, Hamas, not us. They are the ones fighting. But of course, if they want that country, they're going to have to. They're going to have to. Let me, uh, it's 319 going on. It's, it's uh, what is it? 119 going on 120. Let me stop here. And if anybody has any questions or, or comments or observations, we, we, we can have that discussion. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. The sweep of history is just amazing. I'm, you know, I, spent a little time um, in a PhD program in, in political science. And um, that that was, um, I learned more today than I learned in graduate school in my whole graduate career. So thank you so much. We'll see, um, thank uh, you. Just make a few announcements. Um, our next programs are not yet 
um, determined. We um, will take a break on the 26th, uh, November 26th, for the traditional uh, holiday on that day. Um, and then we still are developing programs for the rest of the year in, into the new, new year. But now we'll have a um, opportunity to have a Q&A. Our usual rules on that is that the um, you will uh, look for people to um, raise their hand and um, either make a question or a comment or a combination of both. And to do so, go to that um, icon on the bottom of your screen where there's a happy face and a plus there and hit the your hand up there. And I'll take um, uh, questions in, in the order that I can see, see them. And then um, we ask people to limit your questions or comments to about two minutes and um, Mark will have a chance to uh, speak to them. And then we'll we'll end at um, about an hour from now and um, wrap, wrap things up. So um, I see a hand up from Mario. Uh, Mario, if you could unmute yourself and um, you'll be the first person to be able to make a question or comment. Thanks. Uh, really appreciate the presentation. Really shed light on where we are today. Um, can you please answer the question as to the horrendous situation in Palestine and the recent reports, actually from a few years back, that a large um, uh, oil, um, yeah. large yeah, pools of oil has been found off of Palestine. And also the relationship, well, not necessarily, but also the the power of the dollar. A lot of the left talks to like the dwindling power of the dollar nowadays in, in correlation uh, to the Chinese uh, currency uh, in particular. Thanks. Yeah, all right, Mario, first off, when I saw your hand on the board over here, it was black. I was like, you're not a Yugoslav, are you? One of um, I ident identify with all oppressed peoples all over the world. Okay. Anyway, yeah, uh, yeah, there, there are especially natural gas deposits supposedly off the coast of of Palestine, and obviously here, you know, uh, uh, if if there's oil and gas someplace, the big powers want it, which goes back to what I said before that for the British, uh, the. <laughs> The, the Palestine here was 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 that launching was that launching pad uh, to make sure was that place for to have people from Europe. I mean, that's what these that's where these people came from. They came from Europe, transplanted Europeans. Of course, let's understand something. Many of these many of these people of the Jewish faith didn't want to. Why, why would you want to live in Eastern and Central Europe for at this point? You want out. Many of them left. That's understandable. But at the same time, as they as they of, as they put forth and multiply here, uh, they're they're going to begin to take control of this of this area called Palestine. And by the 1930s, I mean, look what's happening here. You had the you have the Stern Gang. You have the you have the you're going to have the the growth of the Israeli army here in the 1940s. Remember, they fought with the British in World War II. The Jewish Brigade. That's that's the cornerstone of the Israeli army. But at the same time, here with with um, with natural gas. Uh, who 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 do you think Washington wants to control this? Us, or or perhaps even China? You know, so uh, th that this 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 makes what's going on in Palestine very important. You know, again, it's resources. This is Alfred Mackinder. This is Nicholas Spickman. This is George Kennan and Zbigniew Brzezinski. And this all leads to a part of your question too about the dollar. The dollar is the world's reserve currency, and it has to remain that way. Uh, if you if you've noticed in the news, and part of this is not what's going on overseas. Part of this is what's going on at home here, Mario. I mean, take a look at Congress. Does this thing function anymore? I mean, look who your Speaker of the House is. Uh, here's a guy who who a Speaker of the House who believes believes, mind you, that people elected to Congress should have religious tests. You got to be kidding me! Thomas Jefferson would have apoplexy if he ever saw this, uh, or or even Thomas Paine would even be worse. He cut more holes in Christianity than a screen door. It's probably why only eight people went to his funeral. 
But here at this point, the dollar is extremely significant. But if you remember, Mario, just a few months back, what did Fitch credit rating do? They lowered our debt rating from AAA to AA+. Plus. They're a small credit rating agency, Mario, but just the other day, and I'm, and I'm trying to follow this close, Moody's has been making noises here, and they use the same rationale that Fitch did owing to debt ceiling discussions, government shutdowns. Do you know our government shut down eight times during the Reagan administration? This is what these credit rating agencies see and they have to look at this because they 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 they're they're speaking up for their clients. Maybe you don't want to invest. Maybe you want to think twice about investing in the United States. Does this make grabbing that natural ga gas off Palestine important? You know it does. Does that make getting control of the wheat, phosphates, and fertilizers in in Ukraine important? You bet it does. Does that, and the CIA would like nothing better, Mario, than to see the, the, to, to the disillusion of the Russian Federation. Why? Because Eurasia is a supermarket of resources. The British Empire wanted it. If you recall, what did Hitler say in Mein Kampf? The future of the Reich is in the East, not the West. Why? Because that's where the resources are. That's it's the future of the Reich. They all want it. And you don't think Putin doesn't understand this? He's a target. The man's a target. Interesting. I hope that I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Mark. It does. Thanks. Um, the, the stack has Yosef, uh, followed by Gene, followed by Richard. Yosef, it's all yours. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Or, I think you missed an interlude, and I'd like your comment on that uh, in, in terms of uh, overseas expansion of the United States. There's the uh, 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 Triple Tanyan War, the war uh, against Triple in, it, in it, Libya. Right. Uh, so uh, could you uh, comment on that? Yeah, I, well, well uh, Gaddafi, right? Was Gaddafi really the threat he was made out to be? No, or no, no, no. Uh, it, it, the uh, way back in the nineteenth century. Oh, you, you mean, you mean, you mean the, you mean in nineteen eleven when the Italians invaded it? No, 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 no. The, the when the United States sent uh, a oh, navy. Yeah. To... Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the Barbary pirates from the shores uh, of Tripoli. Right. The shores of Tripoli. Right. Yeah. Well. Well. Again, that's that's America going overseas. To enforce to enforce to enforce what it, what it's looking to enforce, and they sent the navy for that. And interesting, you can't do that unless you have a navy. Of course, let's understand something too, Yosef. We are fighting pirates. We are not fighting the French navy, and we are not fighting the Royal Navy. That one, by by comparison, was easy. That was easy, but it does show that America is developing here a long reach. And that was one of the reasons I wrote my book on the Great White Fleet, because if any if 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 if, if anything shows a nation is looking to expand influence beyond its borders, it's a navy. We've seen this over and over and over through history. Interesting. Very very good. Um, next is Gene, followed by Richard. Hello, Gene. Uh, hi, Mark. Really. I'm always wowed by your uh, discussion and your kind of encyclopedic knowledge of what, what uh, all the events here. And I really enjoyed your talk. And uh, again, I have no life, Gene. This is all I do. <laughs> many of us don't have lives. So uh, <laughs> that's not, anyway, let me just say that, um, uh, it, you know, the, the your talk and the presence situation of humanity basically is domination by euro american civilization but that you know if you look at it in the long sweep of history it's a fairly recent phenomenon if you go back before say 1500 uh that was the period when it was the west and europe that was undeveloped and the developed regions were china and India. 
and uh, there's and uh, there, there's this book. I don't know if you know it or not, uh, by Andrew Gunder Frank, uh, Reorient, basically saying, okay, this is just a blip in world history and the history of our species. Uh, the next period is going to be marked by a reorient when the world economy reorients itself around China and India. And uh, watching current events and so forth, what's going on and the, the assertion of China. Um, and again, I think people think it wants to dominate the world. I don't read it that way. I see it wants to dom it wants to be assert its legitimate interests in East Asia, uh, but not necessarily globally, although we do have the Belt and Road Initiative and other kinds of things, which are very interesting. But I just wonder if you'd address that particular change in 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 geopolitics, uh, what, what what Frank calls reorienting. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you can even go back, Gene, to the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, 800, 900, uh, 1000 BC, 1100 BC. And Baghdad was the center of this. And this was the place you went to if you wanted to, you know, for mathematics, science, literature, music. Uh, they had tamed the Tigris and Euphrates rivers with what were then uh, the the the, uh, the, uh, the the top flight technology in irrigation, so on and so forth. And yet compare that to 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 Western Europe, you know, in the Dark Ages. It's like comparing uh, it's like comparing uh, Wall Street to the South Bronx. Uh, so, but but is that really discussed that much? No, it's not. No, it's not. But man goes through these periods where somebody has that time under the sun, and then when they're on their way down, there's always there someone there trying to fill the void. History tells you this century after century after century after century. I mean, what happened to the Assyrian Empire? What happened to the Greek Empire? What happened to the Rome? You get the picture here. We are not going to be any different. We are not going to be any different. We are people too. We're human too. We are subject to the human failings. And man cannot seem, I mean, history tells you, man cannot seem to maintain a continuity. Once he gets to that point, I mean, take a look at the nation now. There was a point when we had a functioning system of representative government. We got one of those now? No, we don't. We don't. We are corroding from within, just like Rome. And the founders of this country warned that the, of the, of the corroded na corroding nature of Rome. And they thought with the Republic, they were looking to prevent that. Madison said, Madison said, it's human nature. Beware of human nature. And it's human, na it's human nature, it seems. If you read people like um, Wilford Trotter, and I just finished reading that book not long ago, The Base Instincts, the base instincts of, the, get this, the base instincts of the herd in peacetime and in war. Wow. And I give talks on a man called Edward Bernays. And Bernays was a disciple, in a way, of, of Trotter. Bernays, by the way, is Sigmund Freud, was Sigmund Freud's nephew. He is the man who literally created American consumerism. How to channel people over a, a you know a mass of people to move them in fewer directions. He says that's the only way democracy is going to work. You can't have 111 million people moving in 111 million different directions. You've got to narrow the menu so it's easier to keep them keep them going in one direction, a few directions at, at, at you know at, at one time. And so interesting, but we have but it it that it's backfired here. You know, you're, you're, you don't have a functioning system of representative government anymore. We have now become a war capitalist state. That's what we've become. We are taking too many resources out of the system for war. And the system at home is paying the price for this. And I've been teaching my classes this for the last 11 years. That if we, in fact, Ken Moore, you've been in my, in my classes. Uh, I've, I've said this for the last 11 years, that 
if we don't get off this merry-go-round, if we don't end this progression and start a new one, we are going to be in a violent period sometime in the fourth decade of this century. When? Can't pinpoint it. It's like trying to pick the, the, the top or the bottom of a stock price. You might be reasonably accurate. But we are going to have a problem here if we don't return some of the resources and money to rebuild the American system. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. But China, by the way, but China, Eugene, might not have any choice but to try to become that global power. Destiny might push them that way. Uh, uh, events not, not of their making might push them that way. You know, once you start like, it's like war, Jane. People start wars, well, we want to do this, 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 and this. But wars have a tendency to take a life of their own and you no longer chart events, you are being dragged by events. And that gets to be a problem. Okay, well, thank you. And okay. thank, thank you. Us. And then okay. next is Richard Wright, followed by Peter. Hey, Mark. Oh. Hello, Richard. Oh, always good to hear you talk. Uh, um, just real quickly. Well, first off, let me say that um, recently I, I, I got to... I got to see the north and south ends of, of Lake Champlain. So I got to see that pre-colonial um, uh, stuff up close and personal. Yeah, it's a beautiful lake. Uh, it, it, yeah, and it's, and it's got quite the view in certain places. Yes, um, the, the question I had is, um, um, is maybe you can elaborate at the, same, at the same time, you have the industrial uh, in, in the in the, in the mid nineteenth uh, century. You have the rise of industrialization, but you've also got the the uh, the rise, the very very early rise of financial capital. And I was wondering if you can maybe talk a little bit about the 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 uh, the impact of financial capital on the Monroe Doctrine. Um, yeah, but I'll just leave it there and, and let you. Take it. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, um, uh, the finance in this country is going to grow in the north, Philadelphia, New York. Um, the re most of the resources will be controlled by, by, by the north. Um, you know, the 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 south, the the southerners, they had some good ports for e export import, but I mean, if 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 you take a look at at where the, the development's going to be. Uh, you know, in 1860, uh, there were 9 million people living down south. However, if you're a Southerner, uh, if you're a white Southerner, those almost 4 million Blacks are not people. They're living and breathing property. So you actually have around 5 million Whites. Up north, and, and also, by the way, their economy is built on supremacy. That, that plantation system we call it a plantation system. It's actually the, Amer I call it the American gulag. It's a concentration camp system. And let's understand something about that concentration camp system. It existed many, 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 many more years under the stars and stripes, under the stars and bars, which adds to the longevity of that difference of opinion between the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians. But the Hamiltonian notion is going to grow up north, where Philadelphia, then New York, center of finance. Keep in mind, and this is interesting too, where is oil struck? Pennsylvania, 1859. And oil won't really have, a, have an impact on, on, the, on the revolt of the planters, but it shows you where the north is going. Uh, steel, most of the steel is produced up north. The North has 22 million people versus 5 million whites down South. So who's going to build the bigger army here? It's the North. And once their economy gets untracked, and once that economy goes from being a peacetime to a wartime economy, they're going to, they're going to engage in economic warfare in 1864-65. So you can see where warfare is going. But it's financed by what? Capitalism. I mean, the English and the, 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 the British and the French 
uh, who are they going to invest in? They're going to invest in the in the north. Why? Because that's where the that's where the return is. The return is not down south. You know, you're you're you're, you're talking about you're talking about an army that's going to put together an army of farmers versus an army made off people who are wrench turners. I mean, it's a it's it, this shows you where mo where modernity is going. It shows you where the modern world is going. Because this is levee en masse, conscripting entire populations and economies for war. And it's backed by what? Money, capitalism, finance capitalism. If you don't have the factory system and you don't have a financial system, you can't compete. And as this goes on, let's add another element to this. Oil. Industrialized war needs oil. Or... As Lord Beaverbrook, if you remember that name, Max Aiken, he's the man who was building the fighter planes, the, the Spitfires and Hurricanes for Churchill during the Battle of Britain. He said that the kingdom of the kingdom of heaven runs on righteousness. The kingdom of earth runs on oil. You don't think there's not truth to this? But you need a financial structure and you need an industrialized structure to compete here. If you don't, you lost. You lost. Today, finance is still important, but now you're in the technology revolution. If you notice, not as many people are required to fight in these wars anymore because of technology. Interesting where that went. Interesting where that went. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, so we have a stack right now. And as you know, our stack goes in First come, first serve, except if you've already spoken, then you go to the bottom of the stack. So the stack right now is Peter, Laura, Kit, and then Yousef. Peter, it's all yours. Good afternoon, Peter. Uh, Peter? I, Peter, just... Um, Sorry, can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, this is a great, a great talk with a very wide breadth of history, touching on all kinds of different events that led us to where we are. But what I, what I was thinking about was not simply that the threat of events that led to American supremacy and American global dominance, but the motive forces behind that. Uh, and, you know, there was a number of references kind of describing some of those forces, such as uh, reserve currency, the human nature, a uh, number of other, you know, uh, decisions made in the halls of power in the United States that seemed to have forced this path that the United States has taken. However, I really have a different view. I mean, I'm a Marxist. I, I, I view things from the perspective of capital, from the forces of production that drive, build and drive the expansion of capital. And I don't see human nature as really having any real bearing on, on the, the world, world politics. I mean, I, I, I don't, on the other hand, I, don't, I, can, I can't really entirely swallow the, you know, uh, John Mearsheimer's view of, uh, of real, you know, uh, the real school, real poli real politics school of international relations, where all powers want to dominate, regardless of whether they're socialists or capitalists, they all want to dominate the world. That to me also doesn't really ring true either. But I, I'm interested in you, what you would have to say about uh, the current lineup of strategic international forces, China versus Russia versus the United States, and whether uh, Russia, you know, being true a capitalist country, but without, without any obvious uh, imperialist ambitions, China being a semi-socialist state with capital being exported into Africa and East Asia uh, versus the United States, a dying colonial power with decaying influence, uh, military, mostly military influence. How do you see these forces changing over the next few decades? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how you kind of put all those pieces together. 
Yeah, that's that's uh isn't that the $64 question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. You know, the, what you're seeing, you know, what you're seeing here is the great game being played. And I've mentioned this in in a couple one or two other talks, the great game. I mean, the great game has been with us, Peter, for over two and a half centuries. Although and I and I mentioned this in my recent reply to Senator Blumenthal. Uh he went to he went to Israel. And I, and, I, and I complained about the pro-Israeli flavor of this so-called update that he's giving his constituents. And I made that plain when I sent this back to him. I haven't heard back from him yet. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, the game was played at one point by the British, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch, Tsarist Russia. But the game has evolved you know, over, over this more than two and a half centuries. Japan was in it for a while. Germany was in it for a while, uh, but the the game today is being played by and the, and these are the and these are the big powers if you want to use that term, uh, the United States, the EU is is trying to play the game. Russia is not out of the game. Uh, Japan is still in the game. India is in the game, and China. Now China and India need to be understood here because at one point. They were colonial sat traps for the West. That needs to be appreciated. Don't think they've forgotten this. Since we don't teach history too well here, many Americans have forgotten this. They haven't. But having said that, yes, power seems to be moving from, from West to East. Now, again, China comes to mind here because China can look good in the Middle East because they were a colonial sat trap. At one point, just like the, just like, just like, just like the, uh, the, uh, the, the Arabs were. Keep in mind, this place in the Middle East has been a tramping ground for armies for centuries, centuries. Uh, having said that, you are not the two major protagonists here, Peter, are the United States and China, and what you're seeing here is the United States doctrine of industrial finance capitalism and privatization of government versus communist China's use of state capitalism and socialism. That's the battle. That's the battle. And here in Ukraine in particular, you are seeing the United States, you know, Ukrainians are gonna fight this down to the last, uh, last uh, the United States is gonna fight this down to the last Ukrainian and the Chinese are gonna fight this down to the last Russian. Who do, you, who do you think values the, the the who do you think gives value to the to the ruble here the Shanghai gold exchange that's what that's what that is China and Russia share something here though they don't want NATO spread east because they know what that means they don't want NATO spread east so the battle lines the, in fact it's it's Ukraine that has that have really strengthened the lines between east and west. And don't think you're not seeing this, the, the lines being strengthened again with what's going on in Palestine. Because who supports the Iranians? The Chinese. Who supports Israel? The United States. And Iran supports what? Hezbollah. It supports Assad in Syria. So, Saudi, you know, which way is Saudi Arabia going to go, Peter? It could be next year they might join BRICS. It could be next year Cuba joins BRICS. It could be next year Venezuela joins BRICS. Uh, so the globe is changing here. And like I told Gene, China may not have a choice, but to take the lead here and become the new, let's put it this way, global power or even new superpower. They might not have a choice here. Do they have issues? Yes, they will. Look, look at the size of that population. I wouldn't want to pay that social security bill. That's a big bill. But having said that, uh, they, you know, having said that, they are on their way to becoming that major power. I mean, my, I remember my father telling me, Peter, when I was a kid, when I was a young teen, he told me, if communist China ever wakes up and adopts capitalism, they'll turn Japan into Long Island. What's happening here? What is happening? That's precisely what's happening here. That's precisely what's happening. So it's interesting the dynamics of global power that are being played here. And two of the major and two of the, and two of the largest of the protagonists here were at once 
colonial sat traps for the West. That I find fascinating. That I really find fascinating. Okay. I, hope, I hope that helps answers your question. It's it's really interesting for us to tackle some of these really large questions. Um, on the stack now is Laura, followed by Kit, followed by Norma, followed by Sharon, and Yusef, you're tailing the end of the stack unless somebody else new raises their hand. So, Laura, it's all yours. Hello, Laura. Hello, encyclopedic, really. Um, I have a, two questions, actually. One of them is like the $64 question. Um, and somebody asked me yesterday, uh, looking at Italy and Germany uh, before the fascism took over, what would they have done to avert it? And what can we do now to avert it? And partly thinking about the presidential election coming up and all of that. Um, that's one part of the $64 question. And my second question has to do with, um, they're talking about possibly doing a canal in Nicaragua and mm -hmm. have um, some information or thoughts about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Number one, I'm, I'm going to be teaching a course at Noah Community College, a short course in January and February called The Chancellor. It's about Hitler's rise to power, how he did not take power. It was given to him. Let's understand that. Hitler got the chancellorship. It was given to him. Having said that, if you take a look at both Italy coming out of the 1860s, the Germans coming out of the 1860s, you know, the, the landed gentry in Italy, in particular, you know, the, the privileged set, you had about 26 million people in Italy. And out of those 26 million people, only five, about maybe 500,000 could vote. Why? Because of the, ob of the objective of owning so many acres of land that was part of this. And so what you're seeing here going into the 20th century is this rise in Italy. And you saw this in particular uh, after, the, after the beginning of the 20th century, but it became pronounced after 1918, the rise of socialism and Marxism here. And so fascinating, uh, the army, the businessmen, the bankers, the landed interest, and the Vatican are, you know, are seeing a young man coming up with his fascist minions, and that's who? Benito Mussolini. Right. And on October of 1922, he will take control of Italy. Why? Because, because the, 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 the ruling, the, the ruling uh, aspects of Italy uh, you know, did not trust the people at the voting booth. That's part of this. But Italy did not have a track record, a bona fide track record of representative government. Germany, Bismarck's Germany, he kept the Hohenzollerns at the top, but German, the, underneath the Hohenzollerns, the royal family, is the, cap, is the corporate class. And underneath them are the masses, the workers. He did give the workers health insurance, retirement insurance, so on and so forth. But at the same time, you had, a, you had a Reichstag where you could vote for a representative to represent you from your district in Germany. But in the end, who ran Germany? The Hohenzollerns or the corporate class? That was Bismarck's corporate state. The rise of Hitler is partially contingent on the fact that the Weimar Republic Germany didn't have a long track record of representative government. And that's going to help lead to the rise of Hitler. The problem with the United States here is the reverse. We had a track record of representative government for quite a number of years. Now, it seems that because one of the major reasons that we don't is because of war and empire. You are, this is what the founders warned about with Rome. It's the same sort of thing. And so what you're seeing here, in fact, there's a, there was a poll out not that long ago. 40% of Americans want an authoritarian state. Why? Because representative government's not working. But what kind of, what kind of authoritarian state they, do they want? 
If you take a look at January 6th, what did you see? You saw some American flags. What other flags did you see? Trump flags? You might as well be wearing waving swastikas for Pete's sakes. And so this is the battle here going on in the United States right now, and it's undermining the United States. It's undermining the United States. Your other question as to, what was that? What was the second question? The canal in Nicaragua, the, yeah. the proposed. Yeah, well, the United States lost control of the Suez Canal. I mean, we turned it over to the Panamanians. And so they're, they're in fact. That's Suez, um, Panama Canal. Right, the Panama Canal. Uh, but here, there's another. There's a chance to build another canal. Now, China has offered to do, do a canal in Central America. And you, uh, with the Monroe Doctrine, do you think the United States wants to see China build a canal in Central America? But then again, are we enforcing the, the Monroe Doctrine anymore? There's, a, there's, there's something else I think we need to look at. The, cha the growing change in the political movements in Central and South America. You know, they don't want, many of them don't want the gringo here anymore. They remember what happened in El Salvador. They remember what happened in Chile. They remember what happened in, 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 uh, in, in Guatemala. You know, I mean, Central and South America, and these people know this, Central and South America in the late 19th century into the early 20th was America's laboratory for global expansion. And those people took it on the chin to do that. Of course, we were using American corporations for this. If you remember Chiquita Banana or United Fruit at one point. Yeah. So the, the, again, a canal in, the, in, the, in Central America, who's going to build it? The United States or China? Could be. Could be. Remains to be seen. Remains to be seen. Okay, next is Kit. Okay. Hi, hi, Mark. Um, yes, thank you very much for speaking again. We need more history teachers like you from grade school and up. Um, anyway, I'd like you to comment on the uh, recent APEX summit that happened in San Francisco, and it's just wound up, where 21 Asian nations and hundreds of corporate leaders, with, along with thousands of others, gathered um and in any way to protest um but uh, anyway that was a that's where a lot of trading agreements were established that's my first uh, uh question is for you to comment on what happened and then the race to dominate in space uh we know that this is uh also going on uh which includes looking at the moon and mars as potential territories to exploit so thank you very much mark yeah, the recent APEC meeting. In fact, Roger and I were just talking about it a little bit before um, before we got started here. Uh, you had some uh, had some rounds of unpleasantness on the streets here. Uh, were were that were that meeting? Well, you had you had some out here too, uh, back here in the east, uh, where uh, uh, pro Palestinian uh, demonstrators. And there's been quite a few of them back here east, by the way. Uh, Yusuf could probably tell you more about that because he's, I think he's gone to one or two of these. But the fact of the matter is, APAC is what keeps, uh, keeps uh, the United States in Israel's pocket or vice versa. I mean, many of your, many of your um, uh, elected officials profess allegiance to who? The United States and then Israel? Excuse me, I, I think we're confusing a acronyms um, can, do, do you want to make it a little clearer what, what acronym you're, you're Oh, reading? that's the Asian Pacific Economic. Oh, okay. It stands for. It's the summit that just wound up in San Francisco. Right. With Xi Jinping and uh, Biden was there. Right. And well, 20 other nations. Right. You know, the, 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 two, the two leaders are sitting down and having a discussion here. And the, 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 the fact of the matter is, yeah, do they want to iron out some of the differences here? Yeah, they do. The United States would like to have a meeting with, with, the, from, with, um, with Xi Jinping from the perspective that Ukraine's not going well. And every, the world's ganging up on Israel. China, at the same time, is the largest holder of American debt. 
at over a trillion dollars. And if you want to know who the second largest holder of debt is, it's Saudi Arabia. And so both sides see advantages and disadvantages here. From the U.S. perspective, we see we see uh, we see Saudi Arabia. You know, keep in mind with Saudi Arabia at this point, Saudi it's no longer Abdulaziz ibn Saud's sons running it. It's now Mohammed bin Salman. Now he's a young guy. He's what forty? He can be around a long time. And he's looking to take Saudi Arabia perhaps in a different direction. This is the 21st century. This is no longer the 1950s or 1960s. The world has changed here and they see this change. In fact, keep in mind what you saw here with Mohammed bin Salman. Hamas even said, Hamas said this, they made an announcement that Arab countries that hitched their fortunes to Israel could wind up with the same thing that happened to Israel to happen to them. Now, not long after that announcement, guess what Mohammed bin Salman did? He had audience with the Iranian foreign minister. And so from both sides here, you know, uh, chi China is, is looking to maybe calm things down a little bit, but still expand its power. And, and even though they're not over, as overly excited about maybe trade with the United States anymore, they have a built-in market. They got one, they got 1 1.4 billion people. What, you know, not not to not to dispense with the American market, but they can do a lot better at home at times than they can with the United States. But the the problem here is for both is the dollar. The dollar. China holds our debt, a lot of our debt. The United States is looking to keep control of the dollar as the world's reserve currency. That's the name of the game here. And this is probably, this is most likely what that meeting was about. I'm trying to get more information on that meeting be, because you're, you just you just got over that meeting. So there's still more to get. So what I told you today, today is going to have to be updated. So we just got to keep an eye on the after effects of this meeting. Although it doesn't help when Biden says he's a dictator. That was smooth. Yeah, Xi Jinping said U.S. has a choice of either going for a peaceful world where everybody gains or goes for a war of, of, of imperialist conquest, which will be a zero-sum game. Right. Uh, and then our president said, he's a dictator. <laughs> yeah, well, at least he didn't use the word deplorable. <laughs> yeah. Or brutal, because uh, usually dictator is, is only half yeah. a word. Thank you. Um, next oh, up wait, is- No, I had to step the second part of that question. Oh, I'm sorry. It's about the race to space, the, the domination oh, yeah. of space. Well, that was going to come, wasn't it, Kit? I mean, is that, that that was going to come, right? Isn't that the yeah, next? Yeah. Isn't that the next frontier? You know. Oh yeah. That, that was going <laughs> to come. Uh, however, do do we do we work together with China on this? Uh, you know, the, 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 this this idea of not being confrontational, but 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 working together. I mean, what better way to work together than have an American Chinese base uh, on on the moon? What could be better? You know, uh, is that going to happen? I don't know. You say, you say, but the, the but the race to space that's going to just that's just going to keep going, and it's going to and it's going to develop here, whether we want to take part in it or not. Personally, I would want to take part in it because, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of interesting products that come out of the space program. Believe it or not, in the 1960s, there was a goalie named Jacques Plante, because I used to play hockey. And Plante, uh, you know, and there were still goalies not wearing masks kit in the 1960s. How do you think their faces looked? So he got together with NASA. And using space age materials, he created a goalie mask with NASA that weighed only 10 ounces and could absorb the shock of a slap shot with your getting hit in the face with a puck. That shows you what else could come out of a space program. What other products can be the derivative of science and technology? Interesting. Okay, thank, thank you. And I'm sorry. I, I... Cut off the second part of that question. Uh, on the stack now is Norma, Sharon, uh, Janet had her hand up, uh, and I, I don't know if she's um, still wants to be on that stack. Um, but Norma, it's up, up, 
wasn't I don't I hate to take over or anything, but Yusuf was ahead of me. Um, yeah, but our, okay, okay, our, our okay. usual thing is that, and I explained it a few times, had you been paying attention, that we have people who haven't spoken get to the front of the stack. Uh, I, I, I took my hand down. All right. Um, uh, hello, Mark. Hello, yes. Norma. How are you? Yeah, <laughs> don't ask. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> No, that's a long story, but uh, getting along. You had to sound like Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, not exactly. No, I'm getting along and um, complaining and trying to give direction to everybody within range of my messages, um, it, which is one of the reasons I've got on right now. Uh, there's a neat little discussion. Everybody agrees with me that your reference to human nature, I think, was quickly taken. I don't think you mean that the that the badly behaving, behaving the badly behaving human being is doing so because of their nature of our of the nature of people. There is no such thing as human nature. It's alongside of God and all the other myths that people are subjected to, subdued by. Um, you know, the church being the handmaid of the state in order to subdue people to the will of the state rather than to their own ability to think about. The French Revolution is an example of that. Is that right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The other comment or information I have, and this is directed at you, but maybe other people as well, the word lady that's the admission that the person talking is unable to say woman. Women are the most oppressed group on earth. And it, it, the word lady just expresses that idea. Ladies are the people who curtsy. Ladies are the people who dress the baronesses and the princesses. We are not that creature. We are, I mean, everybody, men and women. I, I came up with the idea about reparations recently. Socialism is the only thing that can provide actual reparations. And it needs to go to, of course, Black people everywhere. And the white working class. The white working class has been the basis for abuse of earth, of people for quite a long time. So don't say lady, say woman. And it's hard for you, hard for people who say lady to go over to saying woman, but give it a try. Practice at home, look in the mirror. <laughs> you know something? You, <laughs> what, what you just said coincides with Elizabeth Cady Stanton when she said in the 19th century, she said the most important revolution in the world is the woman's revolution right and she because half the population are women right somebody put up a note that they can't see your email address here in the chat i'm sure they could they could get it in another way but it, it times out people can only see what on chat from the time that they enter the uh uh the site yeah, okay. I, my, mine, mine was the first. I know. Into the so, chat. So Mark, if you could enter that again, um, and then sure we'll go on to Sharon. Sure, I could. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, when when looking at the history of the Monroe Doctrine, I think it's important to look at the reaction and what was happening in Latin America or in other places in this hemisphere besides the United States at the time, and what might have been the reaction of people in in pl other places in this hemisphere as the United States proclaimed its dominance over the entire hemisphere. And 1823 was saw the the culmination or was it was almost the com culmination of throwing the Spanish out of Latin America, right? 
And so what they weren't quite there yet, but they almost almost. And the Bolari Bolarian, Bo Bolivarian, sorry, countries, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, Peru, and Venezuela were just on the verge of becoming completely independent. Right. Um, Bolivar died in 1830. Um, so he was still, his influence was very much there. And I think we need to look more at what effect the Monroe Doctrine might have had on th those struggles, both positive and negative. And maybe you could say something about the reaction of, of uh, people in Latin America to oh, yeah. this uh, proclamation yeah. by the United States. Yeah, it's interesting because three years after this, Sharon, uh, there's going to be a, there's going to be a, a, a convention here in Central South America of all those what are going to be considered republics here in 1826. Now, there was supposed to be a supranational organization put together that maybe would have shared shared goods and services, uh, maybe organized to have a military association. It fell apart because of our nationalism. It fell apart, just like it would have fallen apart in Eastern Europe. And so interesting here, uh, but they all professed one thing, one thing, no slavery. Well, guess what? The British are going to send uh, observers to this conference. It was said in, the, in Washington, they wanted to send observers to the Congress, to, the, to this conference. Guess what? The South, the Southern states are going to filibuster. And by the time the North is able to overcome that, they sent two delegates from Congress down to South America for this conference. By the time they got there, the conference was over. And guess what else? England, Britain inked trade deals with these fledgling republics here. We got left out in the cold. Why? Because the Southerners, you know, they're still pro-slave. These these uh, upcoming republics disavowed slavery. Why? Because of what the Spanish and Portuguese did. And that's understandable. But we got, we lost trade deals with these new, with these new and upcoming republics. That's three years after the Monroe Doctrine. So what you're saying, there's truth to what you're saying here, because it happened three years later with, with this, with, with, with this big conference among these fledgling republics. But they were trying to put together a supranational organization for themselves, just themselves. It just didn't work out. Right. Bolivar advocated that. Correct. He did. He did. Because he thought that, that was in unity their strength. That's what he thought. But it didn't work out in the end. It didn't work out in the end. But. Now again, I, I can I can hearken over to Norma here. Isn't that part of what we call human nature? Ah, we'll talk to Yusef now. <laughs> you know, and, man, um, man will fact, always man will always usurp his fellow man. He will always consign his fellow man to bondage. He will always make war on his fellow man, and when it suits his purposes, whenever he feels the need for it, uh, forever whatever justification he'll conjure. Uh, he will exterminate fellow members of his species. I sent that to Blumenthal too, and I'm waiting for a reply. Okay. Humans are the only Thank creature you. that that make garbage. And you, Yusuf, are, are you are you up? Um, yeah, yeah, I am. And thank thank you for being so patient and understanding that. The way the stack works is that if you've already already asked a question, you go to the bottom of the stack. Hello again, Yusuf. But, but it's your turn now. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Well, I disagree with you on human nature because evolution um, also uh, uh, imbues altruism. Otherwise, the species get exterminated. Um, that's a pretty good job. That's a, that's a separate discussion. Well, I'm, I'm going to stick my neck out on a, uh, is a subject I normally don't uh, comment on, but my reading of um, Jefferson is that he had in mind small farmers rather than plantation farmers. That's, and, correct. That's correct. Okay, yes, but the small farmers 
uh, in the end, uh, supported the union, and I think that's what uh, and that's what I read to believe that uh, tipped the balance in favor of the uh, uh, North, among other things. Uh, so uh, I have a little problem with that. I don't think he had in mind uh, uh, the Southern uh, plantation uh, economy, which is hard to say is a foundation uh, for democracy. Uh, he may have been, ha had his contradictions, but I don't think uh, that's blatant. That's correct, because of the fact he consulted and he was a disciple of Baron de Montesquieu. He was also a disciple of John Locke, St. John Bolingbroke, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's The Social Contract. Land is the foundation of this country. It is the economic liberty is the foundation of this country. That's what it is. If you weren't a remember, if you weren't a landowner in the beginning, you couldn't vote. Obviously, women couldn't vote. The Indians aren't going to be able to, it's their land we're taking in the first place. Forget blacks, they can't vote, they're out. Uh, but if you if you were a poor white man with no land, you couldn't vote. Only landowners could vote. John Jay said uh the who those who own the country ought to run it. Well, it was landowners. However, being a disciple of Baron de, Mont de Montesquieu, is, Montesquieu is interesting. All re the small republics are the best republics because there's an overburdening amount of small landowners who will keep the, the large landowners in line. But as republics grow, there's still many more landowners, Yusuf, but the growth of the large landowners also grow as well. And guess what? It's only a matter of time before they're going to collude and put their strength together and take control. That's the end of the Republic. Alexander Hamilton's going to say he's, he's a big supporter of the Republic, but also industrialization of finance. But he said the Republic will work until the people give up their obligations in the Republic and support somebody like a Pied Piper. What are you seeing right now with some of these Republicans? The Pied Piper is who? Donnie Trump? Of course it is. And so Hamilton is right. Jefferson was right. And so when, when you're looking at the Republic, the way it was originally formed, but you're right. It's, it's small, but that's not, it's small landowners, but that's not the plantation owners. Because into the nineteenth into the nineteenth century, Yusuf, because they control the cash crops, the cotton, tobacco, the sugar, the rice, they are doing something not much different than the Russian boyers. The Russian boyers are who supported the czar. Why? Because of the manners they had, they kept the peasants in line. Here is an offshoot of that. Only here, it's not it's not the boyers who really run the country. It is the plantation owners. These plantations have created plantation owners created these fiefdoms. They control the they control the local politics, and the small farmer exists selling his grain and his livestock to the plantation owner. After that, he's out of the mix. It's the plantation owner who sells the cash crops. He makes the big money. In fact, Yosef, in 1860, the average Southern small farmer was worth $1,781. You know how much the average plantation owner was worth? Over $24,000. Who has the economic control? Who has the political control? It's the plantation owner the landed gentry, and they don't want industrialization. They don't want it because they know that means the end of them. Yet the slave, the black, is the engine of agrarian capitalism. That's not what you're seeing up north. They have a working class and they're paying a working class and a larger factory system. So when it comes to the civil war, which becomes an industrialized war in the end, who's gonna win? The people, the people uh, are armed with hoes or the people who are turning the wrenches? It's going to be the people who are turning the wrenches who's going to win that war. But you're right. Yeah, but that's, that's what Jefferson the, saw. Yeah, but the, um, the, the uh, 
people with uh, plantation owners don't use hoes. They 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 use uh, slaves to correct. Uh, uh, so what I'm saying is actually the people with hoes. Uh, uh, in the end, the majority of them, at least, uh, supported the union, and that's right. Uh, since that union had an army, correct, correct, correct. I mean, there, there's more to it than we have time for here. There was also the idea of states' rights. Uh, I mean, the, the the in the beginning, uh, the 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 Articles of Confederation, they couldn't tax. Well, some of these people, you think they want to be taxed? But then, where the money? Where's the money going to come from for fighting the fighting the British during the American Revolution? That that's another issue, though. That's another issue. That's a different okay. talk, actually. Okay. Well, it's about um, seventeen minutes after the hour, and I, I don't see any more hands. So what I'll do is I'll, I'm going to interject and make ask a question, and then Mark, I'll ask you uh, to maybe address that question. We also take an opportunity to, if if you have some final words to sum up your your um, thesis here, we appreciate that. But And my question is, and maybe is a sum up question, because um, one of the themes of this presentation today is that the United States is, in your words, no longer a republic. And so what was the seminal event that moved the United States from being a Republican form of government to some other form, um, again, using your, your terminology. And um, when did that happen? And what are the consequences of what the United States is? And how would you characterize the United States now in what, what kind of form, if it's no longer a Republic, what kind of form is it? No, oh, it, the, the, the the first the first big nails in the coffin was the Spanish American War. Uh, we are going to do away with the eight seventeen ninety two Militia Act, where uh, that that backed up the Second Amendment, and we are going to go with a National Guard system. And the governors begin to lose control of their so called militias. Power is moving to centrally to being centrally controlled. Uh, the in 1917, to me, is a big one, April 6, 1917, uh, when Congress issues that declaration of war. And now we're now they're 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 making it official. We're now on the world stage. We're now a global power. Having said that, I mean, you're going to see things like like the, the War Industries Board, where that's a big one where we are now in a capitalist war. And I agree with Lenin there. It's a capitalist war. It's what this is. This idea of the war being a war for democracy is put forth by Woodrow Wilson. I mean, you've got to be deaf, dumb, and stupid to believe this. This war was fought for money, colonies, politics, and power. That's what it's fought for. But the war industries board, you know, uh, individualism. What happened to you owning your own corporation? You don't own your own corporation anymore. It is now controlled by Bernard Baruch. Remember that name? He is the czar for the American economy. And so it's all knitted into one economy. This is levé en masse. And so we need so many widgets from you. We need them such and such a date. And you got it in the, in the transportation companies, which are no longer owned individually, but overseen by Washington. We'll take it to the shipping companies. The shipping companies were overseen by Washington. You see what happened here? The creation of a corporate state. And that will really get legs after 1945. And in 1940, Roosevelt, came out with the Defense Plant Corporation. He knew that maybe these large, even large corporations could not afford to build the additional square millions of square feet of factory space for this war. So what did he do? Defense Plant Corporation, the taxpayer is the stockholder. The taxpayer will build millions of square feet of factory space and lease it to the big corporations. Now, what does that do? Big business, Big government is becoming what? More closely tied. And as you go through the 1950s, 1960s, Vietnam is an accelerator here. You know, I was doing some research in Army Aviation Magazine about the helicopter in Vietnam. And interesting, World War I cost us $2 million an hour. You know how much Vietnam was costing us in 1968 and 1969? Try 14 million bucks an hour and it's a loser a loser, yet we never recovered from this. And the big thing here is 
the Lewis Powell memo in 19, August 1971, where he says to protect free market, it's not free market, don't give me that stuff. Big business needs to insinuate itself into the economy, into Congress, into the education system, and to put off the put because keep in mind you had the anti-war demonstrators in the 60s, you got the Civil Rights Act, and and I'm sure some of you might remember if you were in college in the 60s, weren't there weren't there students and academics who were questioning capitalism? Can't have that. You can't question the state religion. That's what capitalism is. It is the American state religion. And as I always say, the the capital of the country, it's not Washington, D.C. The capital is only 40 miles south of me. It's called Wall Street. If anything, Washington, D.C., I'll leave you with this. Washington, D.C., at best today, is that off-ramp on I-95 between Sodom and Gomorrah. That's where it's gone. Thank you very much, Mark. It's always a pleasure to have you as part of the community at the Marxist Library. And again, it's been a masterful presentation. And thank you, everybody else, for participating. Have a good day. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Had a good time. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609 or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is marxistlibr.org. Dot org.